Well, good morning, Bridgetown Church. Uh, those of you joining us online and those of you in the room with us this morning, uh, we're gonna move into our time of worship uh, centering around joy this morning. If you didn't know, this is the second week of Advent and our emphasis or the thing that we're meditating on is the joy of our salvation, the joy that comes from Messiah entering into our world. So with that, I wanted to read Isaiah chapter nine over us. As I do that, my exhortation or invitation to you is that you would really listen to the words being proclaimed by this prophet who testified about Jesus long before his birth, that you would allow them to evoke and even stir up your spirit to worship even more deeply with us this morning. Isaiah chapter nine. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation. You have increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's worship together. Come, we give you glory. We sing those words of thankfulness in our hearts. For he alone is worthy. Let's pray together. Jesus, in this moment, we do want to join with all creation in proclaiming who you are, in worshiping you and responding to your extraordinary love and presence. So we pray together, come Holy Spirit, and help us to that end. Come even now as you have stirred up our affections and our imagination for and towards you. And come and even deepen those realities within us. Jesus, we love you. We want to see and know more of you. We want to experience the reality of your spirit breaking into this world, into our chaos, into our brokenness, and into our pain. So now, God, as we have sung, now we pray. Come and do just that among us. Help us where your children were crying out. Help us, Lord Jesus. Come and lead us in this time. Take us even further than we anticipated, even further than we dreamed of, even in this hour and a half we have together. And Father, it's with gratitude and thankfulness that we pray these things in advance and in faith. Let me do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Bridgetown Church, and Merry Christmas to you. All right. Well, some of you are excited. It's Christmas time, and uh, we're pretty excited. If you are new or visiting Bridgetown, uh, we just want to say welcome. My name is Bethany. I'm one of the leaders around here. And you should know that we are a church that have kind of 
built our community around three goals, three ambitions, and that is to be with Jesus, meaning we actually want to have a relationship, encounters with God himself, to become like him, to be transformed by his presence in our lives, to, to even look like him to the world around us. And then really to do what he did. We want to be people who don't just experience God's presence, but pour that out and, and even uh, are conduits for God's presence in other people's life. Those are our ambitions. That's what we're all about here at Bridgetown. And honestly, wherever you're at on your journey, we just want to say that you are welcome here. It's our prayer, even before we gathered this morning, that you would experience God's presence and his love. So that's our hope, that's our ambition, and we're grateful that you're joining us this morning. Uh, when Jesus was here, he did talk a lot about us being family. So we're gonna take actually the next few minutes and just greet one another, welcome each other. Those of you at home uh, and online joining us, go ahead and reach out to your community or just even a friend, uh, if you will, and just say hi and good morning. Those of you in the room, uh, safely, please greet and don't spit or lick on any, lick anybody. And, um, and we're going to uh, do that this morning, Bridgetown, kids if you are with us you're free now to go to your class otherwise let's say hello and greet one another this morning Hey, again, uh, good morning. Have a, a wonderful day in front of you. If we have not met yet, my name is Gerald. Thank you so much for gathering with us, friends, at home, online. We absolutely miss you. I think so much more even in this Advent series. Uh, there's just sadness at not being able to see your faces on Sundays as we gather um, as a family. We look forward to when we can do that again. I had a small taste of that yesterday for all the families that came through the Bridgetown Kids Christmas drive-in yesterday. It was really good to see you guys. Uh, it was so fun to just connect um, a little bit in that way. We absolutely love you guys. Uh, this is our moment where we pause for generosity. And as I look back, as we're coming almost to the end of this year, and everybody said, amen, amen. Um, I just want to pause and reflect from myself as a member of our elder team and our staff team, just our absolute gratitude for each one of you that has, um, through God's prompting, said yes to giving financially to Bridgetown Church this year. We are just filled with deep gratitude. And for some, this year was the first time that you ever gave. And we just want to recognize that is huge, that God is doing something in your heart that's connected to faith and even around finances, where this time, we just want to celebrate with you that this was a first for many in this year. That is absolutely 
amazing. Um, so would you, with me out loud, we're going to read this giving liturgy, which is from these key New Testament passages that really inform um, God's thoughts and our attitude about giving. So out loud together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. So with that fresh in your thinking and in your heart, um, you can give three different ways through an app called PushPay. You can give um, online or by text. If you have a Bible, would you go ahead and open it as we continue in this uh, season about Advent, and John Mark's going to come up to teach. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see a few of you in the room. Hi to all of you gathering with us online. Happy Christmas to you. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 as we continue our teaching series on Advent. Luke chapter 2. We even have a child in the room. I've never been so excited to have noise in my sermon. That's okay. I'm actually really happy about it. Luke chapter 2. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here, for your pleasure that you see us through the lens of your Son, Jesus, that you, as we apprentice under him, are turning us into men and women into the kinds of creatures who have the capacity to one day rule in the kingdom under Jesus. God, that future is bright and it is glorious. And while this year feels like a setback for the United States of America, it is not for the kingdom of heaven. And we thank you that our hope, God, goes far beyond our nation, far beyond the many factors of the last year, into you, Jesus, and your return. And this Christmas, we look not just back to your coming, but forward to your second coming. And we pray in the meantime, Holy Spirit, come. Fill and flood our mind and our body itself with your truth and your spirit. Amen. Christian Wyman, the celebrated poet and professor of literature from Yale and Christian intellectual, in his most recent book, Joy, which is a collection of poetry and writings on the subject matter of joy, opens his book with an, a maxim that is well used by artists the world over, light writes white. Meaning, if you're not familiar with that maxim, if you are a poet or a novelist or a fine art painter and you sit down to a blank page or a canvas and all is light in your world, meaning Meaning all is well. The odds are that you stare at a blank page, that you have nothing to say or nothing to paint. You have no inspiration. Art, so the thinking goes, is born out of inner turmoil as you kind of wrestle with the demons that are below the surface. And Wyman, who is a brilliant mind, basically has, he opens his, his book with an essay that is basically a counter argument. He writes that light writes white, says less about art and more about artists. I read Joy last winter after Christmas. It was a gift from my wife, T. In the Comer House, we observe Yola Bokoflod, which is a tradition that we picked up on a trip to Iceland. Yola Bokoflod is Icelandic for Yule Book Flood. And the tradition is on Christmas Eve, you gift each other a book and chocolate. And then if you're a family or whatever, you all climb into bed, bed together again and cuddle, and you read your book to kind of usher in Christmas morning. For a, a, a literary family like ours, it is a tradition made in heaven. But reading through Wyman's collection through the winter, and I aim for a poem a night, and I miss a lot when I'm tired. So it was well into the spring and well into COVID. I was struck by how easy it is to miss the goodness of our life with God in his world. 
by the fact that it is easier, at least in my experience, to be sad than glad. Whatever you think about the origins of human beings, I myself am a bit of a skeptic in all honesty with evolutionary theory, but evolutionary biologists tell us, and this is not in doubt, that the human brain is hardwired to focus on the negative in our field of vision. We evolved, they would argue, on the plains of Africa, and our ancestors' survival kind of depended on scanning the horizon for a threat, and we're still doing that every time we read the news, scanning the horizon for a predator or a roving band of evil men or whatever it is. And whether or not that interpretation of the data points of science is right or off the mark, either way, there is no doubt the human brain is bent toward the negative. Years ago, I read an article by a neuroscientist that said it takes just three seconds for a negative memory to imprint on the brain, but 14 seconds for a positive one. He said at the end of the article, your brain is like flypaper for negativity and Teflon for positivity. Since then, if you ever, come on, can I get a little bit of a laugh? I know it's a really depressing year, but like a little bit. We're here together. We're still breathing. All right. Since then, if you ever hang out with our family on the Sabbath or on a hike in the summer or on vacation, we do this weird thing we call take an imprint, where wherever we're in a good moment, a sunset or a really good meal or a beautiful vista on a hike, we pause and for 14 seconds, we just hold still, all quiet, and we look out and we just try to be as present as we can to the moment, to what's in front of us, to our body, to what we're feeling in our body, and let it imprint on our brain. That way, any time, a year later, a decade later, when we call up that memory, at a, my understanding of the science, I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is it will release the same neurochemical happiness into our body years later, and it has been our experience. All that to say, our brains are bent to focus on all that is wrong with the world. One of many words for that in the Bible is sin. Add to that that we are living in a world that is under assault from the three enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Add to that the 24-7 digital news cycle, which is an economic model built to profit off of our inbuilt fear of predators on the horizon. Add to that all things 2020, which no matter what your personality is, has magnified our negative view of the world. And add to that the holidays, which are a mixed bag for a lot of people. For some of you, it's the most most wonderful time of the year. No, I'm not Christian. I'm not going to sing. That's it. That's all you get tonight. All right. I am a Christian. I'm not Christian. If you're a part of our church, you know what that means. Um, but for many of you, it is the most wonderful time of the year. And for others, it is a time where you feel the acute pain of social isolation or of a relational breakdown in your family or your marriage or your life. My point is a lot of us are feeling little to no joy this Christmas. But listen to the lyrics of this well-known Christian hymn that is really more of a theological treatise than it is a sentimental carol. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the light of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Set aside the Christmas sentiment for a moment. What is this? Is this denial? Is this wishful thinking? Is this an author who's taking full advantage of the new organ law around psychedelic mushrooms? Is this escapism? Or is this something else? Luke chapter 2, please stand with me, those of you in the room, for the reading of Scripture. And even if you're at home, I invite you, if you're around the table or in the living room, just to stand to honor God and honor the text that we are about to read, which is more than a text. It is the inspired Scripture. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. 
So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea and to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the th time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Take a seat. I know that most of you are familiar with the story we just read, but let's key in on verse 10, which is really the crux of the story. It is the message at the center of it from heaven to earth. Take a look again at verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. As we've said all year long, this is the most common command in all of scripture. And by the way, in the Christmas story, fear is at the root of what has gone wrong in the human condition. It is in the writings of the New Testament, the antithesis of love. One way to frame the spiritual journey is as a decline in fear and a rising sense of trust and confidence in God. Do not be afraid. Next section of the message, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now, the phrase good news is one word in Greek, euangelion. Can you say that? You went well done. You're here and alive and awake. It's where we get words like evangelism or evangelistic from euangelion. It can also be translated gospel in an older translation or in the Christmas vernacular, glad tidings. Now, we think of gospel as a kind of serious word, as a theological word, but in the first century, it was a happy, from the first century, it was a happy word and a political word. Whenever a new king was born or a war was won, the empire would send out a preacher or a herald to preach the gospel or to spread all of the good news or the glad tidings about the birth of a king or the defeat of an enemy. Hence the next line, good news that will cause great joy. No, not just joy, but great joy. In fact, the word great, the adjective in Greek is mega. You got to love that. Mega joy. Imagine that feeling you get if you've ever had this experience. When something that you've been waiting for or wanting out of the blue just comes to pass, you fall in love or you hear that your favorite author or movie director is making a film you've always wanted to see, or imagine if somebody just burst into the back door right now of the basement of our church or those of you at home, burst, knock, knock on the door, rap, rap, rap. Somebody were to burst in and say, I have good news. They just discovered a miracle cure for COVID. There's no weirdness about it. Everybody on the right and the left is a fan of it. Trump and Biden both just took it. It's easy. It's available for all. You can take it. We can be done. Let's go out for drinks tonight. 
what would you feel if that were to happen in a very hypothetical scenario? Yes, you would feel mega joy. You would feel it course through your entire body. That's the idea of the story. Here are these shepherds that are sitting there and waiting. By the way, the shepherds are most likely children. If you've ever been to the Middle East, to this day, shepherds are still about my kid's age out here, about 10, 11, 12 years old. It's why they're running all around town being wild and telling everybody because children can't suppress joy. It just has to leak out. And these shepherds were waiting. Most likely, a lot of scholars argue the shepherds were guarding over the flock that was right around Bethlehem where all of the sheep were raised for the Passover sacrifice in Jerusalem. They literally, their job was to raise sheep that were to look back to the Passover and to the Exodus and forward to the new Exodus and the new Moses, the new deliverer on the horizon, prophesied about all through the Old Testament. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. And here is good news, a surprise out of the blue. That, that feeling, that is the idea, that the result of the gospel at an emotional level is joy. But also notice, what is the gospel in the story? Second half of the message, verse 11. Today, in the town of David, or in Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That right there is the gospel. Does that sound like the gospel to you? Notice that in the story, the gospel is not, hey, you can go to heaven when you die if you pray this prayer. The gospel is not, you can be justified by grace through faith, not by works, not by your own effort. The gospel is not, you can be healthy and wealthy. The gospel is not, social justice is here for the whole world. Not that any of that stuff is bad, but that's just not the gospel. That may or may not be the byproduct of the gospel, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is not about me or about you at all. It's about the long-awaited Messiah, that he has been born in Bethlehem, just like the prophet said hundreds of years before, and that he is a king, but he is more than just a king. He is the Lord. The Greek word there is kyrios. It was the Greek word used as a title, transliteration of Yahweh in the Old Testament, meaning this long-awaited king is more than just a political leader. He is in some mysterious incarnation, the embodiment of the living. God himself. And where there is a king, there is a kingdom. To say the king has come is another way of saying the kingdom has come. Now, since we live in 21st century, kind of in an American democracy, not in a first century Jewish monarchy, the kingdom of God is a bit of a foreign concept to us. I, I continue to wonder if the country of God is better language for us. But let me sketch out for you a biblical theology of the gospel of kingdom in three very simple parts. Give me two minutes. One. First century Jews divided human history into two ages, this age and the age to come. This age was marked by the rule of Satan, sin, and death. It was an epoch of pain and of suffering and of waiting for God to come and put the world to rights, to kind of set the human project back on track per Genesis 2. The age to come was yet future, and it was marked by the rule of God or the kingdom of God, a time of peace and of prosperity for all under God's loving and wise dominion. It was, as the prophet Isaiah said of those in the age to come, quote, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. That is something to look forward to. First century Jews were waiting for the Messiah, or the Greek kind of version of that word is the Christ. Both were words for a coming king who would usher in the age to come, who would lead humanity into its next epoch, who would take humanity in to the kingdom of God. Number two, the gospel is that Jesus is that long-awaited king, and he has come to usher in the kingdom of God and make it available for all who repent and believe, even though the kingdom is nothing like what we were expecting. 
Note the word in verse 10, good news that will cause great joy for all people. We read right over that word all, and we just nod our head in a kind of modern pluralistic society. If you were a first century Jew, that would have shocked you. All people? As in Gentiles too? As in people who are unclean or not Torah observant? Yes, all people, not just Jews, not just the wealthy and well-connected, not just the people who are, quote, good, but all who in Jesus' language used later in the gospel, repent and believe. Or to kind of elaborate on that language, who rethink everything they think they know about what will lead to the good life and put their trust in Jesus' mental maps to reality and apprentice under him into kingdom living and walk with him deeper into the inner life of the Trinity itself. Number three, the kingdom of God is now and it's not yet in the language of a famous theologian, George Eldon Ladd. What most Jews in the first century were expecting was a clean, kind of clear line of demarcation between this age and the age to come. But what actually happened was a surprise, as it often is. And Jesus' birth and his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension dragged the future into the present, the age to come into this age. Jesus opened up a portal to the coming world, a way to live under God's rule now as an advanced sign of what is yet to come for the whole world. That, by the way, is the aim of the church, the aim of us here together, to function as the vanguard of the social order that is coming one day for the whole world. But don't veer into utopianism. We now live in what theologians call the time between the times, in this kind of messy middle between his first coming and his second, between Jesus' first coming to inaugurate the kingdom of God and the church and his second to bring the kingdom of God to its climax over the whole world. Contrary to what you might think, and this was news to me until not that long ago, in church history, the Advent season was less about Jesus' first coming, or what we call Christmas, Christmas. And the focus was more on his second coming, or what we call judgment, which in a Hebrew mind is actually not a bad word. It's a good word. We want justice would be a more important word for it, a coming day of justice and of peace. Fleming Rutledge in her magisterial Advent book, thank you, Bethany, for that, writes about how Advent isn't just a season in the church calendar. It is the tone and the timber of our inner emotional life as followers of Jesus. Quote, in a very real sense, the Christian community lives in Advent all of the time. It can well be called the time between because the people of God live in the time between the first coming of Christ incognito in the stable in Bethlehem him and his second coming in glory to judge the living and the dead. In the time between, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. Advent contains within itself the crucial balance of the now and not yet that our faith requires. The disappointment, brokenness, suffering, and pain that characterize life in this present world is held in dynamic tension with the promise of future glory that is yet to come. In that Advent season, the church lives its life. In that Advent, in that dynamic tension between sorrow and joy, we live our life together with Jesus. Because we live in this age, we feel sorrow, but because we also live with at least one foot, if not more, in the age to come. We live on earth, and in a sense, we live in heaven. We live under the rule of God. We also feel joy, not sorrow or joy, but sorrow and joy. And the more you mature in Jesus, the more you enlarge and expand your capacity to hold both in dynamic tension. Now, you may ask, if all of that is true, and not just like a nice idea, why am I not experiencing joy? And a lot of people right now are not experiencing joy. Some of my best friends who are people of deep godlikeness 
are not experiencing joy right now. More people I know dealing with mental health issue and depression and anxiety and the ache and the pang of isolation than ever before. Why? Why is that if the result of the gospel is in theory at an emotional level great joy? Well, one, it's just because it was a very hard year. Can we all agree on that? And we're human and contingent and fragile and vulnerable and we suffer and in the end we die. If you're not all chipper this Christmas, go easy on yourself. You are not alone. But also because joy is more than just an emotion. And the same is true for the other three Advent themes of love and peace and hope. All four, if you think about those as emotions, you miss the point and they will never sink into you. All four are more than just emotions. They are the inner condition of the heart of Jesus, who is loving and joyful and peaceful and hopeful, that we take on in our own inner woman or man as we apprentice under Jesus over a lifetime. And God does his work of healing and renewal in our soul. But herein lies a key idea. Our relationship to joy isn't just passive, it's also active. Joy isn't just something we feel, it's also something we choose. It is a deliberate decision we make to joy in God, or in the language of the New Testament, to rejoice. That word rejoice is an English, we don't really use that in Portland much, slash at all. In the New Testament, it's the verb form of the noun joy. To rejoice is to joy in God. Henry Nouwen said it this way, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Or here's Richard Foster. The decision to set the mind on the higher things of life is an act of the will. That is why celebration is a discipline. It is not something that falls on our heads. It is the result of a consciously chosen way of thinking and living. Or take a look at this from Rick Ho, whose book series on joy is a hidden gem. If you're late in your Christmas shopping, just Google Rick Ho, H-O-W-E. He has a three-part book you've never, a book series you've never heard of on joy that is just water for the soul. It's like my Sabbath reading. I love it. He writes, emotions are the tip of the iceberg. Iceberg. There is much more beneath the surface. And when we explore that territory, we discover that we are active participants and contributors to our emotional states. Even if it seems that we have little control over our feelings per se, we do have a say about their entourage of values, beliefs, and desires. We can affirm them or deny them, embrace them or reject them, cultivate them or put them in check. That is what makes it possible for us to school our emotions. Wisely or foolishly, in healthy or unhealthy ways, we all manage our emotions. This in turn plays an important role in the formation of our character, and this makes our emotions morally significant. He goes on to write, the pursuit of joy is a moral obligation. How good is that? It is a moral obligation. Now, how do we do this? How do we fulfill our moral obligation to be happy people as Jesus is happy? And none of this distinction between joy and happiness, I get the sentiment of it. It is not biblical. Do a simple word study. Joy, happiness, pleasure, delight, all are in the semantic domain together. It is the heart of God. It's what the Trinity is like. More on that in a few minutes. How do we do this? As we live in between the ages with a brain that is hardwired to focus on the bad, and in a year like 2020, as we come to the end of it, thank God, how do we move from fear, like the shepherds in the story, to joy? And again, that is the spiritual journey, and for sure it is the emotional arc of Advent. How do we move from fear, sitting in the waiting and the dark and the cold, to the joy, the mega joy that is the result of the gospel? Well, the short answer is by practicing the way of Jesus, by arranging our day and our week so that we regularly experience deep joy in our life with God in his kingdom through prayer and community. A more specific answer is turn to Philippians chapter 4, if you still have your Bible in your lap. Philippians chapter 4, 
which is the best kind of how-to text I know of in all of scripture on kind of how to grow and mature in joy. I think I touch on it about once a year. Let's end here. If you're familiar with Paul's writings, most of his letters, not all, but the vast majority, fall into a paradigm that theologians call the indicative imperative, meaning the first half is indicative. It's all about what God has done for us in Christ. The second half is imperative, meaning it's full of commands or imperatives about how we as disciples of Jesus are to live into what God has done for us in Christ. Take a look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice, there's the word again, in the Lord always. Note that joy is a command. It is something that we are commanded to do. As Martin Luther once said, a Christian should be joyful. If he's not, the devil is tempting him. You got to put that up on your wall. Rejoice in the Lord always. Notice not just when all is well in the world. If you wait around for that, you will have very few moments of joy. I will say it again. Rejoice. Paul is just driving the point home just how important joy is in our spirit spiritual formation. But how? Next line, verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I read that passage as kind of a tutorial from Paul on joy. You could break down Paul's tutorial into three basic steps if you were to summarize and simplify. Number one is just to give thanks. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. In Paul's theology, the practice of gratitude is how we grow in our faith or our trust in God. But gratitude is a posture before it's a practice. It's a posture where we receive our life as a gift from our loving creator rather than grasp for it as a right of the human condition. But it's also a practice by which we cultivate and become people of greater joy through both ritual and redirection. Ritual, we find ways to habituate gratitude into our day and our week and our year. For me, I start every morning with a very simple gratitude ritual. For our family, we begin and end every Sabbath and very common, a just dinner table around the table with a conversation around what we are grateful for. And then redirection, meaning when thoughts come about how bad your life is or hard your life is or unfair your life is, and if you're anything like me, those thoughts come a lot. So you get plenty of opportunity to practice on this one. When those thoughts come, you just redirect your mind, which is, I think, best defined as directed attention to what you are grateful for. So when the thought comes to you as a native Californian, this is a hypothetical scenario. I have a friend who deals with this. And the thought comes to you, what a dark, cold, miserable day. There's no way to be happy today. You redirect to God, Jaron here from Hawaii. You're like, I feel your pain, bro. You redirect to thank you, God, that I'm safe and I'm warm and I'm dry and I have a roof over my head and I have a job and I have a, or, or if I don't, I'm here and I'm okay and I'm fed and I have community around me to care for me. Ritual and redirection. You just do that over a lifetime, not over weeks, not over months, not even over years, over a lifetime and you become joyful. And we need gratitude now more than ever before. We're coming off Thanksgiving. Did you know that the Thanksgiving holiday was made official during the Civil War under Lincoln when our nation was divided and torn apart and suffering, when our ancestors were more aware of the human capacity for evil than ever before? 
and all of the false promises of politics and even of religion had fallen by the wayside. The need to focus on how good our life is before God was then and still is now key. First off, give thanks. Secondly, draw near to God in prayer. Verse 5, the Lord is near. I love that line. Therefore, do not be anxious. But in every situation by prayer, present your request to God. God is near. Go to God in prayer. Take your anxiety to God. The main source of our joy is proximity to God himself, who in biblical theology, contrary to popular imaginings of him, even in the church, is the most joyful being in the universe. As the magnificent 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Barth said of the Trinity, this triune being and life is raised Radiant, and what it radiates is joy. At the center of the Trinity, at the center of all reality, is life-giving, self-giving, generous, loving, joy and delight. Or in the language of Scripture, Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. A text which for many years was common to engrave on your tombstone. Joy in your presence. C.S. Lewis used this analogy. Good things as well as bad, as you know, are caught by a kind of infection. Ooh, it's a little too close to home right now. If you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They are not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, just hand out to anyone. They are a great foundation of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will wet you, but if you are not, you will remain dry. Meaning his formula for joy was basically get close to the source of joy itself, the Trinity that we call God. Again, Rick Howe, joy can become a steady Godward disposition, orienting our hearts and including us toward him. It can be a foundational emotion, a shaping and empowering affection. It can be a current that flows steadily beneath the surface of all that we experience. This is not the joy of a spiritual novice, but of seasoned saints who, like Paul, have their spiritual sense trained, focused, and centered in God, who can say without hypocrisy that they rejoice in the Lord. Lord always. We experience this joy by living in God's presence and for his pleasure. Finally, number three is to curate your mind stream. Verse eight, one of the first scriptures my parents ever had me memorize as a child, and we did the same with our children. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about, meditate on is another way to translate that. Direct your attention to. Note that Paul's list of what we are to fill our imagination with is the exact opposite of the mind stream that is wired into our brain by digital media. Read the news or scroll through Twitter or just don't, um, at least not today. It is a feed of all that is untrue, ignoble, wicked, impure, ugly, and gross, of bad reputation, poor in moral quality, and blameworthy. How are we ever going to fill our mind and our body itself with the joy of Jesus if all we ever think about are the things that humans have made ugly or sad? You can make a strong case that joy is a cultivated way of seeing the world, just like cynicism or sarcasm or negativity or paranoia. Milton so famously said in Paradise Lost, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. What we give our attention to, what we think about on a regular basis, what we fill our mind with has the potential to index our life toward heaven or toward hell. 
As disciples of Jesus, we must discipline our mind and our thought life to focus on the goodness of our life with Jesus in the kingdom. But that's it. It's so simple in Paul's mind. Just slow down long enough. Let go of the life you wish you had to receive as gift the life you actually have. And then just give thanks, draw near to God, and curate what you think about. Do this over and over, year over year, decade over decade, and you will in time experience what Paul calls the renewal of your mind, what scientists call neuroplasticity. You will become a person with a new mind, with the mind of Christ, a person for whom joy is your baseline, your, quote, foundational emotion. Other emotions are there, yes. Other emotions come and go. No, you're not happy all of the time. You're human. You're fragile. You live in a world that is full of pain pain and sorrow and suffering, but joy is the default setting of the person you have become in Christ. That is what's possible as we apprentice under Jesus into kingdom living. That is good news. To end, none of this is natural for me at all. A lot of you know my story. I don't want to rehash all of that. But leading clinical psychologists argue, and there's debate on this, but that 50% of happiness is genetic, meaning a, a massive factor in how happy you are is just like whether or not you won the genetic lottery. I mean, how God made you or whatever. It's kind of just how your personality, right? By personality, I am melancholy and sensitive. Many of you know about my struggle with anxiety and depression and obsession since my late teens. It doesn't mean that I'm not joyful too. I, th I think more and more I am both. I am joyful and I'm bent toward anxiety and sadness. One of the reasons I love Jesus and honestly one of the reasons that I love prayer that is not just like honest to God, like I love to get up in the morning and pray. I just ache for it. I'm sad every morning when that time is over. I know for a lot of you, that's not your experience yet. It feels more like duty or discipline than delight. Stick with it. It will change. For me, I think the reason that I love it is not because I'm disciplined. It's definitely not a virtue. It's because I'm desperate. Because I am not happy by nature. Some people can just get up in the morning, read the news, chuckle at it, and go about and have a great day. I cannot. I am not wired that way at all. For me to have any chance at a happy day, I have to ground my mind, my body, my thought life, the orientation of my heart, the desire of my inner man has to be in the Trinitarian presence. And when I sit with God morning by morning, evening by evening as I fall asleep, what I experience radiating at me from the Trinity who is not only all around me but who is inside me by the Spirit of God as I am in Christ and Christ is in the Father and the Father is in me. I experience joy and love and peace and hope. But I'm also human. And then I check my email 10 minutes later and it's not so happy. That's not what's radiating from my inbox at all. It's not love and joy and peace and hope. There's a lot of other things in there. And then I read the news and then disappointment because something I've been waiting for does not come to pass. And it's easy, especially for those of us on the underside of that 50%, to give in to sorrow. But 2020, and I'm just about done, is a once, I've been saying this all year, it is a once in a lifetime chance to grow. And I'm preaching to myself here more than I am to you. If we want to enlarge our soul's capacity for joy, the best way is to open our heart to suffering. Because suffering, none of us want to hear this, but it is so true. It is, you could argue, the primary way that God does his work of stripping us of our attachments, of all the things we think we need to live a happy life, but actually hold us back from God and hold us back from God's joy. If you want to become a joyful person, open your heart wide to suffering and let God have his way. Open your heart to God right now, right where you are in this season with this pain, with this loss, with this disappointment, with even death in your life. 
as we read in the vision series not that long ago, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Remember that word consider is a a counting term. It's mathematical. Add up the factor of your life and realize that the good, in a sense, will outweigh the bad. The joy will outweigh the sorrow because you are through all of this becoming a person of love and of joy and of peace and of hope as you consent to the work of God in your soul in this time. To end, Bono once said, joy is an act of defiance. You got to love that. To rejoice in a year like 2020 is an act of defiance. It is a guerrilla insurgency against the three enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, in a city like Portland, joy is a sign that you are living in another kingdom. If you're happy right now, you are living in another kingdom. The flesh, over a millennia ago, Aquinas said, no one can live without delight, and that is why a man deprived of spiritual joy goes over to carnal pleasures. Morality as a form of duty is a stoic idea. It is not a Christian one. There is a place for duty and discipleship, but it is a place for the immature, not for the mature. It is a holdover until we mature to become more like Jesus, as discipleship itself is about the journey from morality as duty and discipline to morality as delight and joy in God. And the devil, we all know the devil is anti-joy. Martin Luther, who had a lifelong struggle with depression, said the devil, quote, cannot stand gaiety. He cannot stand joy. As we wrap up, take a look at this beautiful poem. I just have to read a little poetry. I'm just sorry. I tried. I know poetry is not most of your thing, but I just have to read this to you. I've been thinking about it all week long. It's so good. I have it in my little prayer journal. I read it on a regular basis. Jack Gilbert. If we deny our happiness... Resist our satisfaction. We lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the roofless furnace of this world. Here's the line. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. We must admit that there will be music despite everything. That's why I read a poem every night before bed right there. They're not all that good, unfortunately, but that's a good one. Again, this doesn't mean that we don't grieve over the pain and suffering of life, in particular in a world like 2020. Doesn't mean that we do not work and take an active stand against evil and injustice, we do. And it doesn't mean that we don't feel sorrow. Again, we do. It just means we don't take that as the whole measure of reality. That's not all we give our attention to. I think of Paul's line in 2 Corinthians, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Again, not sorrow or joy, Sorrow and joy. Sorrow over all things 2020, whatever pain you are feeling now in your body itself, and joy over the fact that we are living in the kingdom of God with Jesus, made open and available to all of us through Jesus, and it's good, and it's here, and it's coming in full. May you live in the joy of the gospel. Let's stand together and pray. Just take a moment with me in the quiet to just breathe and let that sink in. The gospel, the joy of the gospel, let that sink into your body. Come, Holy Spirit. Do the work. Do your work. Have your way. We yield to you in the silence.
Hey, as we uh, continue to worship, um, we just have a few words, things that we sense God is saying. We believe God speaks today and that God heals today. And when he speaks, it's called prophecy, which simply is described as words that encourage you or comfort you or build you up. So I hope that these do that. And the first is just for those that are struggling, um, maybe depression or a sense of lack of purpose, and that our sense was that uh, the joy of the Lord today is uh, for you externally, that he wants to give that to you. You don't have to drum it up today, but he wants to give that to you. So we're going to pray for you in just a minute, but if that's you, I hope that's encouraging. And then our friend Christiana has uh, the next one. Yeah, we were um, talking at pre-gathering prayer and Gerald had a word for somebody or maybe multiple people who need to make some decisions and they maybe haven't heard from God or they're waiting to hear from God. And I heard the word or the name Joshua as he was talking. So maybe this is for Joshua. Maybe there are even more people that it might apply to. But um, I had a picture of a really tall tree planted by a river. And it brought to mind um, the words in Psalm 1 where it talks about um, that uh, a person that is like a tree planted by the river is someone who meditates on the word of God. And so um, as John Mark encouraged us um, to draw near to God during this time and um, that God is there and he wants to speak. And then just um, one more, I had a sense as we were praying for our time together this morning that there might be some of us who, myself very much included, uh, who in this season, holidays, everything that's going on, are reaching for attachments that may be good in name or even in practice. You know, maybe it's just relational touch points or just habits that may be good habits, but may feel a bit compulsive or, or be turning into something you feel like you're using to actually medicate and avoid the reality of the invitation of the Spirit of God. Um, and so, uh, and even in line with, I think, some of what John Mark just even shared about attachments and us being freed up from certain things so that we're free to experience what God is doing, what he's cultivating in us. I just had the sense that there's an invitation to surrender, that it wasn't supposed to be hard work that we had to do, we didn't have to struggle or wrestle, but that we got to just release those, release even the desire, or the compulsivity, or whatever it is that may be driving us to experience more freedom of the spirit. So um, I wanna pray that over us, whether that resonates with you or not. We also wanna pray just for an impartation of joy this morning that God would just deposit it in our family. And for those of us who are desperate for it, especially in this holiday season, man, we just wanna be open to what God has. So we join me in praying. If, if that resonates with you, just I would just encourage you to take a posture of openness or of receiving from the Lord this morning as we pray and ask him to do this among us. So Spirit of God, we pray pray even now that you would come to us, that you would settle upon us. Holy Spirit, you say that we can ask for what we need, and so we come in this moment asking you for joy. God, just thinking about this Christmas story of you, Jesus, crashing into the mess, crashing into the darkness and bringing light, we pray that same reality would come to bear on us by way of joy. Would you, even in this moment, Spirit of God, for those at home and those of us in the room, would you come crashing in with joy? Would you deposit in us, impart to us this gift of the Trinity, this gift of the reality of life that we find within it. Would you change our thinking in this season? Would you change our feeling? Would you change our disposition, the things that our eyes are drawn to, the things that our spirit's drawn to? Would it be drawn all to you? Spirit, if we're holding on to something, if we're allowing our attachments to someone or something to keep us from receiving all that you have for us, we pray, Spirit of God, you'd come now and set us free that you would respond to our surrender and you would make much of it so that we'd be freed up to receive all that you have for us in this coming season. Father, thank you that we're not without hope, that we're not left on our own. I pray for the encouragement even now of your spirit to come and to remind us of that reality. As you come and do that, would you bring joy? 
So, Father, we pray these things now together. We pray it as your children. We pray it in faith, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Bridgetown family, our prayer and our deepest desire for you this week is that you may find yourself close to God. You may sense his presence, and in some way, you may receive his joy deep into your being and that it might become your joy. May this second week of Advent truly be a time of joy for you. And if you're new or you have questions about Jesus, faith, God, all of this, I would invite you to try Alpha. Alpha is a space where you can come and ask anything. It's where people that have no faith or a little faith or a lot of doubts or just questions come to discuss all of these important topics. But we love you guys. Can't wait to see you in person and have a great rest of your day.